Children, how wonderful to see children. Yes. Praise God. I have no clue who these folks are, but welcome. God bless you. Pardon me? Oh, they're Virgil and Irene's family. Okay. Welcome to Sunday night service, folks. And you know, even though Pastor isn't here, and Johnny isn't here, the Lord is here. Amen. And we're going to have a good worship time and a wonderful service, and I know we're going to hear an anointed and wonderful message from the Lord tonight. So let's all enter into the presence of the Lord and just enjoy this evening and worship God. And Nadine, it's so good to have you home. Amen. I sent her a text yesterday and told her it was time for her to get back in church. So, <laughs> here she is. It's nice to know somebody minds me. <laughs> we missed you. Glad to have you back. Okay, let's all stand. Just got you seated. Now you can stand. And let's go to prayer and ask God's blessing upon our souls. Father, we just come into your presence tonight in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Jesus, Holy Spirit, and our Father God, we invite you all three into this service tonight that you would work and move and move among us tonight, yes. dear Lord. Anoint every word that's spoken, every song that's sang, and every word that is ministered from this pulpit tonight. Bless the hearts of those that are here. And we just thank you and praise you for your blessings. Be with Pastor Shirley and Johnny tonight, Lord, as she ministers in Prescott Valley. And God, that you just anoint her and give her a word from off the altar tonight, we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Stay standing if you can. If you need to sit down, please feel free to do that. It's beginning to
sure lots of you have been. But we need just, we need more than the, the rain that falls from the sky in this valley. Hallelujah. We need the Holy Ghost rain to come down. Amen. So as we're singing it, think and pray for the Lord. Send down your rain. Send down your rain. The power, the Holy Ghost rain is what we need. We need a fire set burning up in us. Praise God. Send down the rain, Lord. Send down. Wrong. 
like the peace that comes from the Father. If you need to sit down, you can. Yes. Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> Going for a breath. <laughs> and a swallow of water.
play that in memory of Brother Renee for Sister Maureen. It's his favorite song.
problem to be why God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall, he cannot move it. Sorrow to deep, he cannot soothe it. For if he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know, my brother, that he will carry you. Jesus, you know their hearts are broken tonight. 
Lord, the grief they're feeling is beyond words, Lord, and so deep that I'm sure they can't even express it. But Lord, I know that baby is safe in your arms today, but this family is left without a child. And Lord, I pray that you would comfort them and be near them. Pour out your love and your grace and your mercy upon them tonight, oh God, and comfort their grieving hearts. Use Pastor Ralph tonight, Lord, as he talks and, and counsels with his family, oh God, that he will be able to lead them to Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you would have your perfect will in these lives, in that community. Lord, a small community, Jesus, and their local folks, and Jesus, I just pray that you would send somebody to them to help them and comfort them in the days and the weeks and the months ahead. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion and your grace. And we just thank you, Lord, and for all these things in your blessed and your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for carrying this burden with us tonight. And continue to pray for this family through the week, if you would. Only God knows what's, what they're going through right now. But oh, thank God we have a God. <laughs> Aren't you glad that we have a God and we know where to go when those problems come and those trials come? If he carried the weight of the world on his shoulder, he can carry you. He can carry this family. Oh, Margie, thank you for that beautiful song. I've loved that song for many years. We're blessed tonight that Brother Ray is going to minister to us. Yes. I know that it is a great comfort to Sister Kenzie to know that she has someone she can fall back on when she needs help. And we're so glad Ray's here to minister to us tonight. And Ray, come and just let the Lord use you, whatever you have, you and the God have planned. Welcome and thank you for coming. I uh, see a lot of young people here and that just gets me excited. Let me make a couple of announcements and get them out of the way. First of all, uh, I know that there's some who came tonight expecting, uh, and I must have not made myself clear, expecting to see a film that we was going to show or uh, and it is a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous movie. And, and I believe that it is life-changing. It was made. It's not going to be tonight. It's going to be next Sunday night. And I want you to make your, if you've ever made an effort to be to a service, I want you to come to this service. I want you to bring your neighbors. I want you to bring the kids. I want you to bring... Uh, your closest friends, your family. I'm, it, it's a, it's just a life-changing experience. And it's, there's a lot of humor in it. You'll laugh and you cry, and then soon you'll cry. And it's, it's just strictly about the way that the Lord dealt with an individual. And it's basically, and my wife has told me, don't give too much of it away, but it's basically a man that the Lord dealt with concerning a man who lived across the street from him. This man had was a lonely man and had mental problems and, and the Lord laid it on this fellow's heart to go and to take care of him. And he went in, did some work on his house, took him to a ball game in St. Louis. That part was really... But, oh, see, I, okay, I, can't, I can't tell you the rest. Oh man. He's excited. Be here. Bring someone. And if they've never been to church before, they're going to enjoy it. Be here. And then also, I have to thank the men's group. Uh, we had uh, 15 at our first meeting, and I believe there was 10 at this last meeting. Several had legitimate excuses that they could not be there. I believe we're going to grow. 
The meeting is the first and third Saturday of the month, 9.30 right here. Come fellas, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. We have coffee and donuts and fruit. We just sat around and talk, men's talk and look at the Bible and I, I believe that it will be a blessing to you. So remember that if you possibly can. Attend and I'm sure that you will be blessed. I'm going to speak tonight on the subject, the last mile. Probably because when you get to be my age and you have done a lot of things and seen a lot of things, probably one of the most heartbreaking things is when you see people who started out serving the Lord or maybe they lived for God in Sunday school or something, but they grew up and, and they kind of lost out. They, they just got distracted along the way. And especially people in the last part of their years when it seems like they've almost made it home. That last mile somehow they've got tripped up. I'm going to be reading from Timothy the fourth chapter, the first through the tenth verse. And because it is God's word and you've been setting for a while, will you stand while I read this word? And this is Apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament. What a fighter he was. And it's coming time now when he's about to go less than the last mile. He's just a short time from now and he's going to give his life for the cause of Christ. And he says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the dead and the quick at his appearing in his kingdom. And he said, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he says, For the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. And then he said this, he said, for I am now ready to be offered. They're about to take my life. I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. But I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them that love his appearance, his appearing. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for each person that is here. And I pray, Master, as we speak tonight about faithfulness and being true and how you will give us strength to stand. I pray that you will minister to each one that is here. I pray that you will bless every man, woman, and child that is in this place. Place your arms around them, love on them, protect them. Master, until the time that we see you appear. And we're going to thank you for it in thy lovely name. Amen. 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 I have a picture and I believe maybe that we're going to be able to put it on the screen. It's a picture that really has affected me. Maybe it's because that I'm uh, not just a preacher, but I'm a horseman, cowboy, trained horses. I love horses. And when I seen this picture, it made an impact that I can't get out of my mind and I hope if they're able to put this up that it's going to affect you in the same way. It's a picture of a horse that is working in the coal mines. And I want you, as you look at this horse, 
You're not going to see a beautiful animal, but you're going to see an animal with his mane not kept. You can tell that the horse is getting up in years and his head is bowed down to the ground. What I really want you to see, and if they don't get it on the screen, I have the picture, I'm going to show it to you. There are some things that I want you to pay particular attention to as you look at this picture. I want you to look first of all at his feet, especially his front feet, because this horse is straining like I have never seen a horse train before. Do you see it? His hoofs in the back is broken. He's not just on his feet, but if you look carefully, he's up on his toes. Behind him is a load of coal that he is pulling. Virgil, you said, I hope your chains are gone. Look at the chains that he's straining against. The yoke that is hairy that is up on his neck, his head down almost to the ground, and every muscle straining. Let me read what it says under this picture. It says, this photograph was taken in 1917 in an underground mine. The horse was blind, as all such horses were due to a lifetime in total darkness. And he said that every time that I look at this picture, I say to myself, he's got one more mile to go. See, when I look at that picture, and the reason that I can't get it out of my mind, I see this poor beast blind, poor, abused, with a load that is way too heavy for him. Sometimes in my spiritual walk, I've been there, have you? Yes, I have. Load's just too heavy, God, don't you understand? Sometimes I feel like I'm chained and the yoke is too heavy, God. But for you, help. Help me just to pull this load one more mile. Just one more mile. See, this is a story that I've just read to you out of the Bible. We're going to talk about a man that because of his stand for Christ, they're about to put him to death. He needs to go. Just a few more steps. We used to sing that song a lot. One step more, one step more. Give me faith for one step more. One step more, my Savior. One step more. Oh, give me faith for just one step more. I do not know when this life is going to be over. When you reach my age, you know it's not going to be long. 
But when you look around at the world and you compare it with what Jesus had to say, then you know that the returning of our Savior is very, very close. It has to be. Yes, amen. When Jesus was on this earth and he was walking with his apostles and his followers, he made the statement to them that it was necessary for him to go away and though he was going to go away, that he would come again. Yes. The scripture says that Jesus is going to come again and he's going to receive us unto himself where he is. We shall also. Hallelujah. Yeah. The disciples asked the question, when is this going to be? When are you going to come back? Jesus did not answer that question, though he did give some clues. Right. His answer to them was that it was God's secret when the Lord would come back. Remember, he told them that only the Father knows. It's God's secret. I have been raised in a Christian home all of my life. And I remember the Sunday schools, the revivals, the teaching, my folks. And I was taught that Jesus could appear any time. And I expected that he would come just any time. Yes. We was raised to where it was my dad that would read the Bible to us. We would sit on his lap or beside him and my dad would read the Bible. And before any of us could ever go to bed, we knelt down and prayed. If there was a time that I happened to slip in bed early because I was tired, you could rest assured that one of my parents would come and say, did you pray before you went to bed? And if I said no, I had to get up, get on my knees, and I prayed. I expected Jesus to come just any time, and, and I, every prayer I said, oh Lord, forgive me of my sins, and if I've sinned and I'm not aware of it, forgive me of it. Because I, I, I thought Jesus was coming. In fact, I remember my brother who was 18 months older than I one time, and, and he used to pick on me quite a bit. I, we, was just, we were just smaller than these kids, but I knew a lot about the Bible. Sometimes I got it twisted up, but I knew a lot about it because we heard it every day. And my brother had done something to me that was an injustice. And so I thought, well, he's going to apologize because he, he, he's going to realize that he hurt me and he owes me an apology, but it didn't happen. Well, he's going to apologize to me whenever my dad reads the Bible, then his conscience is going to be pricked and he's going to say, hey, bud, I'm sorry, but I, my dad read the Bible and it didn't happen. Well, he's not going to go to bed without apologizing. <laughs> he's going to tell me that he's sorry for what he did. We went to bed and we lived out on a farm in that house that had no running water. We had an outhouse. We had no uh, uh, electricity. Uh, I never even knew what a phone was. We had coal oil lamps and, and my brother and I slept in a room on the floor. We was poor, but we was content and we was happy. So we went to bed and I thought my brother is going to ask for an apology just in a minute, but he didn't. It's dark and black in the house and I said, hey Norman, <laughs> you know that if Jesus comes, you can't go to heaven because you didn't ask for an apology. I had some preacher in me and I thought that would shake him up. But there was no answer. Norman, I think Jesus is coming tonight. What makes you think that Jesus is coming tonight? Because me and my cousin Delroy, we was out 
in the field looking up at the sky and we saw a shooting star and the Bible says there'll be wonders in heaven. And I think that's a sign to me that Jesus is coming tonight. That sermon didn't seem to bother him. And then I said, Norman, you know that when Jesus comes, you can't go with me and mom and daddy to heaven. You're going to the other place that's hot. I wouldn't dare say the word I'd have got. And when I said that, boy, I'm going to tell you what. He must have got under conviction. <laughs> but he said, Raymond, I'm sorry for what I did. And I had it all backwards, and I said, well, you know that if I don't accept your apology, <laughs> you can't go to heaven. <laughs> well, Raymond, I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? Aww. I got to think about it. <laughs> and this is true, and, I, I, and all of a sudden I heard a squeal. More than any other sinner had ever come to an altar in a revival meeting, and he says, Ma! I told Raymond I'm sorry, and he won't forgive me. <laughs> Raymond, you forgive your brother. She didn't even ask what it was. Norman, I, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Mama! Raymond still won't forgive me. My mom said, Raymond, are you going to forgive him or do I have to get up out of bed? I didn't want my mom to get up out of bed for a couple reasons. First of all, she worked hard. She scrubbed clothes over one of those scrub boards. We didn't have a washing machine and I didn't want her to get out of bed and the second reason I didn't want to get out of bed, it wasn't my dad, it was my mom that did the corporal, I almost said capital, <laughs> corporal punishment. And I mean that my mother was patriotic, as one said, she believed in old glory and the stars and stripes. She gave God the glory, me the stripes, and I said the stripes. And I said, Norman, brother, you are forgiven. Never have we got along as well as we did after that because I knew that if I ever said something that was offensive to my brother, he was going to hold me over that same standard. We got along just great for a long time. And though Jesus <laughs> didn't come that night, I expected him to come maybe the next night. And if I expected him to come all of this time, Though the Bible doesn't declare the time that Jesus is coming back, he talks about clues and earthquakes and, 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 and diseases and, and, and uh, wonders in the sky and wars and rumors of wars. Have we heard that? Have we heard that nation against nation? And then he said that the end is not yet. But when men cry peace, peace. When men cry peace, peace. And we are hearing a lot about that. I'm going to tell you what I told the men and I'll try to rush through it really quick because some of you probably saw it, seen it on Fox News. It's the wife and I watched it just a few nights ago. Our president is talking about peace with North Korea who controlled some of the other countries. But there was a 
person that came on and he was high in the government and in the scientific things and knowledgeable. He wasn't just a reporter or some crap person. I mean, he was there, he could personally talk to the president. And he says, I'll tell you what we are afraid of. He said that it's not a rocket, it's not even a bomb. Then he said the United States is built on the electrical grid in three pieces. The east part of the United States and the west part of the United States split almost down the middle. And Texas is on its own. Texas is not involved. Texas has all of its own electrical power and not dependent on any electricity for power being sent in from I told someone they either need to get saved or move to Texas. <laughs> and he said that they could explode a nuclear device out of a satellite. He says that's what we're worried about is a satellite. It gets in just the right place and they can explode it. <laughs> and MEC, I don't know what that is, but whatever it is, it is a deal that will spread like a cloud over the United States and knock out all of the power grid. Did you see that? The transformers that we have in this country are huge. They're not made here, they're made overseas. They cannot be moved very easily. It's slow and to cross our bridges, they would have to reinforce the bridges. It's almost impossible to move them. We have only 1% in reserve should something happen to these. And these transformers, as electricity comes, it goes to a transformer that sends it on, that sends it on, that sends it on, and that's how the electrical grid is. They said that if the electrical grid would get knocked out, planes would fall from the sky, we would have no electricity, they, you, there would be no gas to be pumped, that you, you couldn't call for help, we would have nothing. And he said that we believe that in the first year alone, 90% of the American population would die. And then he said this on Fox News, he says now Korea has two satellites that is flying overhead. I personally went to President Obama and asked him to shoot them out of the sky because we're afraid. He refused to do so. He says, I'm talking to you because some people think that they can sit back and take a deep breath if Korea gives up its nuclear devices and its rockets, that they don't need that, they probably wouldn't use them anyhow. That's not their weapon. And though we can't positively prove it, we believe that those devices is in the satellites that North Korea has that circles over the United States. I do not know. But I know that over 50 years in the ministry of studying this book, that it cannot be long before Jesus returns. Amen. We are walking the last mile of the way. Yes, you one time knew Jesus as your personal Savior, but something happened and you tripped up. Then you need to get on your knees and ask Him forgiveness and He will forgive you and yes. heaven will rejoice because you came back to the Master. We're in the last mile of the way. Amen. But I want you to see a man that I just read about, Paul. I have some scriptures that back up what I'm about to say, but time forbid that I'm going to be able to read them. But this man, Apostle Paul, he's not much to look at. He wrote two-thirds of the 
New Testament of powerhouse for God, but physically he is small. His eyes is bad. We read where he's talking to a group of his friends and he says, I know if you could, you would pluck out your eyes and give them to me. My Bible in the note says that he was possibly even repulsive to look at. He was a weak man talking about how his flesh looked and yet he was accepted. Talking about how he trembled and he shook. And lived in fear. He's the Apostle Paul, but in the flesh, he's not much. But he's a spiritual powerhouse, and yes. he preached and he suffered for it. The Bible talks about Paul, and he says, and again, I'm not going to have time to read it. You know, he talks about how many times he was shipwrecked. How many times he was beaten for the cause of Christ? Five times he was beaten with 40 lashes, save one, because there was a law that you could not whip somebody or beat them with a whip more than 39 times. Five times he was beaten the 39 He's in jail now, and he's been in jail for years at a time. While he was there, he would write, the Bible. Thank you. This man was one of the wisest men of that time, but he forsook <coughs> that knowledge that he learned concerning the law and the position that he had in the church. He forsook it to follow Christ. And now he's in prison. If you can stand the sight and the smell of that prison and the looks of this broken man that I would ask you to come with me to the prison and I want to talk to him. Paul, you just said that the time of your departure is at hand. You know they're going to take you out and they're going to behead you. I, I got a question that I got to ask you. I, I know that you, you're not just the last mile, but you're a few steps. But do you remember, Paul, when you had everything? You was high in the government, and it was you that persecuted Christians before your conversion. And Whatever you ask of the government, you can have it now. You're beaten. <coughs> Your health is gone. You tremble and you shake. Your eyesight, the smell of this prison is pathetic. And I've got to ask you something, Paul. Was it worth it? Was you living for Christ and taking a stand for Him, was it worth it? Lord Jesus. Yes. Would you tell Timothy and your followers not to be so radical in their belief, just to have a little dab of duty? It's all right to attend a Sunday service someplace once or twice a month that just don't get so involved that you become radical for Christ. Come on now. That little man with a shaky body, though his eyesight is dim, I see a fire in him eyes. <laughs> yes. And he would say like he told Timothy, you preach the word. 
You be instant in season, out of season. Yes. You reprove, you rebuke, you exhort with all long suffering. Because the time of my departure, yes, is at hand. But there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I've got heaven to gain. I've got everything to gain. Yes, it was worth it to go the last mile of Hallelujah. Yes, amen. amen. He's a lonely man. In his writing, he says, Only Luke is with me. Oh, Paul. Paul, 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 Paul. <coughs> the people you knew, the places you have. Only Luke. You've only got one friend. Only Luke is with me. There's three ladies in this church right now. There is a friend of theirs. See, they, they used to all go to the Cornerstone Church of God. The church flourished. There was a tremendous move of God, but the pastor left. Something happened. The church doesn't even exist. But Claudine said, I'm going to get a group of ladies. Men, that's why I need you. I'm going to get a group of ladies. We're going to call it the Cornerstone Ladies. She belongs, and she belongs, and she belongs, and she goes. They, at Christmas time, gather up, through the year, gather up things, and they go to the homes, went to the veterans' hospital. But something happened. One of the group, a lady by the name of Pitt, passed away. And Marilyn, the way I get it, has talked to her son having a funeral, but her relatives in Texas said that they couldn't come. And one of them, the son told me, it looks like there's just going to be us. Boy, this lady, Penny, remember she played the, the, the harmonica and said, what a blessing she was. She'd get me so excited. No one there for the funeral that was what yesterday. Yes. And these ladies got together. The lady's son says, there's not going to be anybody there. Just, I've got a friend that's coming, a preacher. And these ladies got together and went. Nine people the son, his friend, and preacher, six of the ladies. They said it made the son so thankful that somebody cared. See, loneliness. People, there's a lot of lonely people. Right. You can have hundreds of people around you and still be lonely. Amen. It's true. The Bible says that Jesus was lonely in the garden. And I wonder if any of you have ever drank that cup of loneliness with him. He said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not nevertheless. I've done it. I've preached and there was no response and criticism, criticism came after. I'm not doing this for money. I haven't taken an offering of not, not one penny that I'm aware of in 25 years. It's because I love people. Why am I doing this? I can't even talk to my wife about it all the way in the bed and cry. You ever live for Christ? You give a testimony and somebody 
mocks you and makes fun of you and you're just trying to help them. Yes. Oh, yeah. And you're drinking from that cup of loneliness. With him. Paul, I'm so sorry that only Luke is with him. Penny, I'm sorry that only your son and a friend was there till the ladies. <coughs> Raymond, are you going to go the last mile? Are you going to take those last steps? Yes, I am. Because loneliness doesn't last forever. Yes. Yes. Being down in the dumps don't last forever. Virgil, it was you that said, I trust those chains are broken. Those chains yes. are not going to be there forever. Woo! And you is not going to be there forever. And love's not going to be happy yes. forever. I'm not going to be blind forever. Yes. Because oh, Jesus yeah. Christ can come into right. my heart and face a song, open my eyes. Yes. And give me peace and joy in life. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh. Well, bless you, Jesus. I got to do is be willing. <laughs> to go the last mile with him. I'm closing right now. I'm not halfway through my notes. I'm closing. Bless them, Lord. They'll keep. <laughs> my Heavenly Father, I've failed you so many times. But you picked me up and you carried me, like Marvel said. My mind is made up that I'm going to go that last yes. mile of the way. Yes. I need your strength. I need your help. Amen. I need you to be with me yes. as you was with Paul. But I want to make it and I'm going to make it and I'm going to take every step. I wonder why. Every head is bowed and no one is looking around. Absolutely no one looking around. I'm not asking if you're saved, you're not saved, but I want to ask you this. Is there some chains? Is that load just seems sometimes like it's too heavy? Does the devil tell you that it's not worth it? You just can't pull that load any further. I know Jesus is going to help you. I wonder if you'd just slip your head up and slip it back down quickly. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call on you. I just want you to signify to the Master that your mind's made up that you're going to go the last mile of the way. There's the hand. There's the hand. There's the hand. There's the hands over. These people that has raised their hand. They said <laughs> they're going to go another mile. One step more. They're saying when I've gone the last mile of the way. Because at the end of that mind. We're going to behold you face to face. And I pray, Master, that everyone that is here, that you will give them strength, that you will give them power. Oh, 
last mile of the way. You said that we wouldn't be overcome, that, that you'd raise up a standard against the enemy. You said that, 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 that we wouldn't fail, we wouldn't fall, that you would help us. And so we're calling on that strength right now in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? I need a song leader. I need someone to come and lead us in some courses. You know what I would like to do? We are just ordinary people here. Nobody any better than anyone else. We're just children of God. We're all sinners that the Lord has forgiven us of our sins and wrote our name in the land of life. And we need this last mile. We need God in our lives like never before. And we need each other. They needed you, Curtis, the ladies. And we need each other. I wonder if you'd do something. As they sing, I wonder if you'd just come forward and we're going to just stand here. And I'm going to pray and we're going to ask God to give us supernatural strength like we've never had in our lives before. If you have a special need in your life, I want you to come, come on, congregation, the whole congregation, I want you to come forward. Let's do something for him. But let's show him that we love him. And we're going to pray one for another. I want us to pray one for another. We need each other. I want you to take your neighbor by the hand. And I want you to pray for that neighbor. I don't know if you're all or not. I want you to say, Jesus, don't let him go. Jesus, don't let him stumble. Jesus, they might be 